Ooh, plenty of people. <laughs> Hey, Tom. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hey, Michael. Yes, Paul. Yes, Scott. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Tom. Hello, Gus. So, uh, and we've got Yulia yeah. as well. Hey, Mesa. We got the whole gang here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think getting started on this topic, um, I, I was actually just talking with somebody today over uh, LinkedIn about what is a data product? What is what is a data quantum? And how frustrating that uh, that has been um, as a topic for a lot of people because it just it devolves very very quickly. So JGP, you you and I did uh, um, an episode specifically on this of, of Data Mesh Radio. You uh, wrote a very very uh, well published or well shared and liked article on medium about this so i'd love to hear kind of from you what it is and maybe what it isn't and you know how do you think about that relative to max view of it of you know it's the 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 data and the code required to run that data including the metadata and the blah 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 and that becomes in the input port and the output port and how that just starts to kind of devolve around how confusing it is for folks. So I'd love to hear kind of how you're you're thinking about it, and then we can kind of talk about what other people are are feeling and seeing out there. Uh, okay, I was hoping to learn something today, and that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay. So uh, I'm, I don't I don't I don't want to sound arrogant like that, but um, no. The thing is, for me, it's been it's been a struggle as well. Okay, what's the data product? What's 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 a data quantum? And then when you uh, I, I so basically, what I end up doing is that when I'm speaking to business, it's a data product. When I'm when I'm talking to implementation, it's a data quantum, and and that's uh, that's how I kind of uh, decided to 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 break them apart. Okay, so they're kind of the same thing, but one is the implementation of the other. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, do you have a specific definition of what is a data product? Because this has been the, the thing, you know, when I first started digging into data as a product, data products, somebody told me a data product is just a product that is heavily backed by data. And so that'd be like an ML thing or anything like that versus like, because like, and when you are talking to these different people, what is it, right? Like when, when the view of a data product for somebody on the business side it's just like, this is some information that you have easy access to, to leverage for what you need to do versus the architect side. So like, do you have phrasing or anything that you've kind of uh, showed people around that? I, I also have a, a very simplistic definition of a data product. For me, a data product is a data set with a data contract. It can be multiple data sets with multiple data contracts. But the thing is, at the core of it, a data product is a data asset. That's, but that's the thing is, it kind of is the, the technical part, right? Because when you're talking to someone and say, hey, it's a data set with a data contract, oh, really? Is that what you're trying to sell me? Then it has all these characteristics, like like what Jamak describes in the book, like the, you know, the down tiffs, uh, uh acronym. But, but the thing is, for me, it's still, yeah, it's still, at the very base, uh, a data set with a, with a data contract. And the thing is, why 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 I'm trying to minimize it? It's because when you're talking to people and say, oh, especially in the data engineering field, and you're going to data engineers and you say, hey, we're going to build data products. The first thing they do is freak out. Okay, so when you say no, don't freak out. It's the same thing you've been doing. We're just going to add. Um, a data contract to it. Okay, so 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 I know it's it's oversimplifying, and there's a lot of things that comes after. But if you start freaking them out, then you lose them. That at least that's my take on it. <laughs> that that's kind of what I've heard too, uh, Michael. I know you're you've been working in a in a large organization across a whole bunch of different things. So I'd love to hear kind of how you're thinking about it. But JGP, I think that is something that has resonated a lot of people saying. It's really easy to confuse people, so maybe try not to try not to get too technical and too esoteric in the definition. 
Yeah, I think I've had better success in You would just lose Michael. Yeah, I lost yeah. Michael as well. <laughs> His first data product, um, I think of a data product as really any any specific amount of data that provides real contextual value to the business and serves an end customer focus in the way that any other product would. Um, that seems to gravitate, but it's still sort of myopic um, and intangible. Uh, but that's that's sort of what I've been focusing on, which some people are like, well, how is that not just data as a product? And I'm like, that's a great question. I don't know if I fully beat my own answer to it. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think we get too specific and trying to dig too deep into this. You know, Tom, you've been working with a lot of clients as well. Like when you're trying to talk to, are you are you giving different stakeholders different like actual definitions or like how how are you going about that and and what are you finding that resonates with people? Well, I do like the the distinguishing uh, the the difference that George is talking about of the data product when you talk to non technical uh, people and uh, more about the principle of data as a product that you have to have a contract and those things. Um, and the quantum is is indeed really how do you implement such a thing? How do you, you bring that data product or quantum to life, have its own life cycle, um, and and really technically integrate it with the different data tools that you want to use? Um, and um, yeah, not not many of those tools have the data quantum or data product quantum uh, baked in yet, maybe. Um, so what we see is that you do need some kind of uh, or, or layer of platform engineering to really bring that quantum to life um, and, and make it have its life cycle, automate things, uh, provision things in data warehouse tech or other, other places that you want to uh, go into. Yep. Um, and that way, have something in your architecture that really encapsulates that code, metadata, data and all those those characteristics are you finding that the tooling and not, like easily allows you to encapsulate those in one space because what what i've kind of heard is is people going oh i have to go and populate the catalog and i have to do this or do we have to build the thing that that makes it so that they can just do the code and and also i'd love to understand formatting right like when when i think of code i don't think of good formatting so like metadata just looking like it's just one giant block of text coming into the, the catalog is not going to be that great. What, um, what do you mean by formatting? It's just before. So. <laughs> well, like when I'm thinking about just typing in code, like what does it look like in the actual data catalog? So, you know, somebody who's really technical and making an API call, there's, um, you know, you, they, they're going to be used to just kind of the DOS type screen, of just getting text. But when you have a business user, you have somebody that's less technical. Um, like, how are you thinking about that? Well, it depends on who is developing the data product. And, and if it's a data product developer, which is an engineer knows how to code, yeah, then that can be just an IDE like any other uh, um, development environment. Um, I, I, when I talked about the platform and layer, uh, it's, really it's really an orchestration layer. layer. Sorry. You've just got some echo going and I don't know why. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, the, the platform layer is more the, the orchestration layer uh, that brings that data quantum to life, but it doesn't mean for me that um, everything has to be in one tool in one place. So it can still um yeah go into the catalog go into the data warehouse or another type of tech that uh you want to use and in those places reserve a kind of a, a segment for that data product or a segment for that output port of that data product mm -hmm. so that's how we approach it and and by the way for uh, i mean thank you tom but by the way for anybody who hasn't been on before who does want to chat just feel free to to uh, you know, un, you know, show up your camera and like raise your hand or anything like that. But uh, Yulia, I, I, yeah, I was actually, I just wanted to talk to you about this because as a vendor, it's it's something that just keeps 
the these terms just keep getting circled around and around and around. So I'd love to hear how customers are actually or prospects and things are thinking about this and are they as tied up as everyone else seems to be around this this topic? Oh yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone. So I want to touch base on data products because um, eventually it means different things to different people. And uh, what is interesting enough, because again, as a vendor, I actually observe how data teams are using the data. Um, in fact, when it comes back to defining what is data product, I would actually lean towards Mike's definition where he actually highlights that this is data that is put in use um, uh, by business users that actually generate some value. Why do I emphasize on that? Because I actually can see how many data sets data engineers are muting and don't want to hear about any anomalies or errors in those data sets. So that's why my opinion then this, that defining data products, any data set doesn't necessarily make lots of sense because eventually nobody they, like nobody give a shit what is happening in those data sets. I'm sorry for my French. I'm so much sorry. <laughs> yes, well, are you French or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially with JGP on, calling it French is the best. Um, yeah. But but I do think like there was there was an article about Mon from Monzo Bank a while back, and they had like 2,500 people, and they had 4,500, like they were super excited about their lineage. They had 2,500 people in total, and they had 4,500 tables in production, and they were like, we have lineage for absolutely everything, and it was like, why do you have that many things? <laughs> like, this is terrifying to me. So, uh, Andre, you've had your, your, your hand up for a bit, so would love to kind of get your, your view as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, we uh, thought about uh, what we want to um, encounter as data product and what we don't uh, see as data product. And we came up with uh, two really simple uh, criteria. And first, it's uh, what, uh, like uh, Yulia said, uh, we don't want to see as a data product something that wasn't intent to use. So we say that uh, if someone put intention that this set of data, this data should be used by someone else, so this can be a data product. If not, this can, cannot be. So all unfinished work, all like internals are not considered as data product. And second, which is uh, more hard to understand, but it lead us, I believe it lead us to more um, clear uh, environment, we require that data products are developed to meet specific business objective. So um, like eventually all data you have in data warehouse should have some business objective. So because otherwise no one would do it, right? Uh, but having this in definition, um, it lead, leads our customers, it leads our data product producers to put this uh, business objective definition in their documents and their documentation and in the um, uh, specifications of data product. So that's it. That's interesting because I think like uh, Roche has talked about this a little bit, but they have like when you said, what is, is this a data product or is this not? I mean, we kind of have the do we have that life cycle idea as well like it's not that this is just a static table it's that this is evolving and that that business use is evolving um and but Roche talked about I think they've got like 550 things that could be termed as a, a data product but only a certain number you know 100 150 or whatever are actually qualified as full data products because there's a bunch of these things that are in that kind of work in process or, hey, this might be interesting. Can I find a consumer for it? Hey, or hey, this is data on the inside. We're consuming it, but we're exposing it in case it should be data on the outside. Somebody else might want to use it. Like, I think that's that's really uh, a helpful aspect. Uh, Michael, you, you wanted to, to toss in more as well here? Well, I think I more have a question on do people... Uh, have a differentiation between 
data as a product versus data product. Because for me, I view data as a product as like physical data set that feeds maybe a data product or potentially sometimes the data set itself can be the data product depending on what the value it is providing. Um, and I don't know if anyone has ever articulated for me a clear answer that fully I can intuit. And I'm just curious if folks here have thoughts on that. I am not going to give a thought because I, I will take the rest of the time and another hour. Cause I like, there's a reason data mesh radio is on the data as a product podcast network. And I wanted to launch it as the data as a product podcast and not the data product podcast, but specifically that. So uh, Tom and JGP, uh, JGP, let's, let's go to you. Cause you haven't talked for, for quite a while. So I want to, Make sure we, uh, okay. we, we get so, to you as the, as the main host. No, no, it's so, so, sorry, Tom, but for me, it's the same thing. Okay. Because the thing is, otherwise this is, this is going to be super complicated data product equal data as a product. And that's, 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 I stunned by that. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise it's, it's getting ugly. Tom, you, your turn. <laughs> well, I don't fully agree with that in the sense that, um, for me, data as a product is more about the, the the way of thinking about what you're making as valuable and uh, things that Andre said, uh, that it has to be linked to a use case, a business value and those things. And we talk about the data product as really the, yeah, the, 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 the implemented solution, the quantum, the architectural component uh, that yeah, realizes that data as a product part. So it's the principle and the way of thinking about it, designing it, and on the other hand, the architectural component. But it's a way of of looking at it. Yeah. Well, and for me, I'm, I'm not gonna go super deep into this, but for me, it's also like it is a cultural approach. So it's not just relative to the single data product. It is the cultural approach as to how do you think about treating data in a productized way like you do software development so jgp austin which whichever J yeah but so 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 just uh, 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 and maybe we should go to something else because otherwise we're going to spend the whole <laughs> session on that but 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 the, the wolf what i'm thinking is that when you're in software you've got to adopt the product thinking mindset right it's not like uh and and that's that's the, the big major difference so when you're you're just adding data before it so you've got data product and you've got data product thinking and you don't have data as a product okay i i'm 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 I'm, fin I'm finished i'm not saying anything anymore okay <laughs> on, on this one <laughs> Austin. yeah um I, I i was disagreeing at first and then i think as as both of you spoke i i started to agree a little bit more like data as a product is just meant to trigger that mindset that this is something that should grow and evolve and be associated with business value. The output of that, I think, is either where we internally at my company, as well as at our customers, everyone has a different definition, right? Like a snowflake table might be a data product to them because they want to make sure that table has clear ownership, that table has clear descriptions, that table has clear, et cetera. However, some of them do have data product managers who are the ones actually doing the stakeholder management, the ones that are actually making sure that we're documenting that table because it's associated with this key business use case. And so it's kind of an interesting emergence of roles with the whole data product manager thing. Um, I, I had a post on LinkedIn like uh, last week where we do have this interesting thing where it's either you have data products or you don't. And I feel like no one wants to talk about bad data products or data products that you should kill. Um, and my argument is whether or not you read the data mesh book and now you say the words data product, data as a product, um, if you're a functioning company that exists, you have data products, right? Uh, you may not acknowledge them. They may not be the best. They may not be optimal. There may be a lot of clutter like you you know, you were saying, why do you have 4,000 tables? Well, we're at a unique position at our company to see customers with hundreds of thousands of data assets. And it's like, like you said, why? It's like, well, that was a project six months ago. That person started it. They left. The ones that are actually utilized are, are very small. And so like getting to that number, I think is part of being a good product manager of data is basically saying, it's one thing to put a lot of effort into these data products that are driving value, 
But to an engineering stakeholder that I also care about as a data product manager, I should also be encouraged to clean up that clutter, to optimize our data warehouse, to optimize our data stores, et cetera. So, I mean, I think they go hand in hand. Um, it really is about adopting that mindset, but it seems like people forget part of that mindset is acknowledging the bad products um, and, and being able to clean those up as well. Yeah, I mean, there's tech debt within a, a product and then there's tech debt that is the product and, the, and you sunset things. And you, I, I still haven't met a single person in Data Mesh that has sunset a data product. And, and Michael uh, was part of a, um, a panel recently and one of the, the uh, participants kept talking about data generation. Like that's the type of thing, like when you have a data generation strategy, a data sourcing strategy about like, what data do you need to create? Not what data do you have? What data do you need to create? That's where I start to think about data as a product. That's where you start to talk about data product marketing. You start to talk about actually going and talking to your constituents and not just saying, I'm waiting for them to come to me, but you go to them and you go like, how do we create this value? How do we create this value six months from now? So I'm going to start creating, I'm going to start sourcing this data. So when you're actually ready to ask this question, and it's going to be an important business question, that I've created the stuff for you and that we're we're flowing as that type of thing, because you have that roadmap, not just to the data product itself, but to your entire set. Like a lot of what you're talking about is literally just like, how do you think about this enterprise information set? And how do you think about where we want to go and exactly what you're talking about? Of how do we prune our, our these crappy things that people are relying on that aren't good or that people aren't using at all? Or like, how do we actually have those conversations when everybody has historically been incredibly reluctant to get rid of, to delete any data? So JGP, sorry, I've been, I've been talking the whole time while you've got your hand up. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's fine. We all know you and love you, Scott. Uh... <laughs> even when you're taking a third of the time and we've got the stats. Um, but uh, no, so, 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 so what, what, I, uh, what I wanted to ask this audience first to, to, to quickly answer to Michael's question. Yeah, Michael, you can, you can post your controversial question in the chat. It's all okay. We, are, we still love you as well. Uh, but 4,000 tables, I think, I think this, is, this, is, this is okay, okay? I know, I know some companies are talking about something like 90,000 pipelines. So you can imagine that the number of table after, you know, or before or whatever. Um, but, but uh, so I don't think, I don't think that's shocking. I, I'd like to, to drive a little bit the, the, the discussion to what's inside a data quantum. Okay. Because that was kind of the, the, the topic of, of, of the day. What's, what's the hell or what's the, what beep is a data quantum? So that that's why I would like to to drive it a little bit towards towards this discussion. And now some people have raised hands and they just uh, um, uh, they just you scared them appear. off. You scared I them scared off. them off. Okay, so so anyone, what what's inside your data quantum? <laughs> or, or like Paul, you're planning on building these. What what are you planning on starting them as? Are you planning on starting them as a table, or are you plan on starting them as a data set, or how are you thinking about that? So my initial plans on them really are both, both sets. So there'll be data. So that's kind of almost like the data on the inside, the source aligned data that really pretty much maps to where it comes from. But then the real goal of what we're trying to get to is the data set. So basically think of like, you know, there might be a customer one, there might be a product one, might be like invoices one, but then like the true one that's going to really add value would be the data set that kind of merges them all together and has links between it. Um, so what I'm planning on inside would be, so I have big plans. I don't know how I'll get to all of them, but in the, uh, we'll have all the details of kind of, I guess, from my definition. So the definition of the data product, it'll have in there the code that needs to be deployed, where it needs to be deployed, how it needs to be deployed and kind of the steps that can run and actually process it on a daily basis. So like if they have to run SLO checks, the SLO checks are inside of that as well. So that's what I'm in the process of kind of building out right now is the ability to kind of do that. And that's all defined by the definition. So the quantum, that's what I basically think of it as my, my quantum is my definition, which includes you know, kind of like the public facing, like this is what, business people care about, you know, the definitions, the tables, the context, 
And then the technical part is a different section of it, which kind of has all of the like, this is the repo that it belongs to. And this is like the airflow DAGs that might be involved inside of it. So that's I, my I like, 50,000 foot view of what I'm doing. I like that because it's basically like, it's what people care about and that that needs to be contained in there. And if it's people that are consumers care about this, if it's the people that are producers care about this, so this is the self-contained unit, which I think is Jamak's view as well. Samia, you've had your hand up for a while too as well. Uh, yeah, no, plus one to what was just mentioned. To me, it's, I, I think I heard that from uh, Michael earlier as well. The quantum is the infrastructure, the code and the data, right? That's how Jamak defines it. And I've seen that consistently in all the implementations I've done you are creating the infrastructure unit in your catalog. You are creating it in your warehouse, in your data lake storage, because you might need different polyglot or multimodal formats of access. Some people want it on Snowflake, others just want it on a flat file, right? They are data scientists. They wanna to get to their feature engineering approaches. So to me, the quantum really should, um, a, a, offer or the platform should offer the bootstrapping of that con quantum with all the attributes being satisfied, right? Access management is a big thing. I've seen uh, data usage guidelines as necessary if you're in biotech like me, where you have to call out this finance data set can only be used for transparency reporting and not for clinical trial design. It, there's a whole like no-no in those aspects. So to me, it really is that quantum that brings everything together as a whole so that it can be operated, used safely in, in all by all the personas that need to uh, work with that uh, data product. Yeah, well, and then those policies, that policy as code is really important, but at the beginning of your journey, your <laughs> policy as code, it's not going to be very good. So you have to start with simple use cases and like your definition evolves over time or? Yeah, I actually put together a data product life cycle. I think your first MVP, let you've identified you have an Oracle ERP system, right? And you want X data sets from it about suppliers. Um, to me, you just need to get it findable, accessible and secure. Those are simple enough constraints by which you can allow for exploration. So your first MVP is give me an explorable data product. Then I can figure out how I'm going to wrangle the data and make it usable for whatever the intended use is. So the data product will go through various life or that uh, maturity level as you go through um, the life cycle and you don't end up with 4,000 Oracle data, data sets, right? You end up with, um, intended or fit for use uh, data marts. Some people use in the financial line of business, data marts are very popular. Um, they'll start modeling the data with the context of their intended use. And then that ties into your, the, the BI reports and so on. So to me, the, the maturity level will keep increasing where it's uh, explorable, then it's usable by one use case, then it's reusable by many, but not all data products need to be reusable. They're still reducing um, from two weeks to two hours of decision making because you've automated it for that single uh, business outcome. Yeah, no, I think very much that that's where it goes, but where it starts is that exactly if it's uh, <laughs> JGP. No, a little question to Samia. So, um... When when you say you you've got to document the data usage, which I I love this idea, um, is it is it just is it just text or is it something you actually enforce? <laughs> the desire is always to enforce, right? Now, depending on where you are in your maturity curve, enforcing it by policy is always desired. But um, to me, even if it can be part of your runbook before you go live or even before you start designing, you want to make sure that those uh, data, the intended use, there's a lot, lot of legal jargon sometimes when you purchase data sets from different organizations or you use data from different systems that you need to adhere to. And that's something I learned over the last year in biotech where you have to pay a lot of, and you have to pull in legal to understand that, parse that, and then codify it 
that's level zero. And then eventually, hopefully we can automate that so that at bootstrap of like the next use case uh, with those same source uh, data sets, we are thinking along the same lines and it's guided and we're safely going out to the next feature that we want to develop. Yeah, and I'm seeing some people try to do exactly that codify if they can, but it's also, I'm seeing some people um, just go, we're going to have friction around this data set when somebody wants access. We have to know, you have to give us a lot of information where we don't just have automated access control because there is a lot of bad ways that this could be used and there's some good ways that it could be used. So Tom, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, yeah, I just want to pick in um, to the, the, what is your first MVP of your data mesh uh, platform? And also what we do is really focus on that data product as a first step and the life cycle of that. Because you have to have something to build those policy enforcement things, discovery uh, things on top of. And if you don't have that, then you have a very diverse landscape of uh, yeah, data warehouse, data lake tech, uh, like all the different kinds of uh, systems. And putting a layer on top, an abstraction on top, makes that possible to make it more uniform and get it to the discovery, to the policy enforcement. So start with that quantum and make sure that's in your uh, your platform. That's the sort of my guideline for them. Yeah, minimum viable mesh is a topic that has come up and is so difficult to uh, to deal with. Two Austin, data. you've had two, your hand up for a while. Two data oh. products. Yeah, Austin, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I just had a question. You mentioned enforcement and it's something that's, that comes up all the time, especially talking about data products, but also just especially data contracts now too. Um, oops, sorry, it's a notification. Um, enforcement sounds great. And then I think what we end up talking about is like alerting right? You know, it's like an alert or an exception table, you know, and it still ends up being someone manually is going to go in there and actually deal with this. Like, did we build a good, or is enforcement the wrong word? Uh, or have you seen use cases where there actually is a possibility for automated enforcement or more programmatic enforcement? Or is it still, we're kind of just getting better at automated alerting um, at scale? Curious. It's, it's it's funny, reliability engineering practices in data are, it's like, I don't understand how nobody's doing reliability engineering around data. They're doing engineering around data reliability, which is quality, but like, you know, Samia mentioned run books. When you say run books in data, people's eyes just go, what, what, what? We have to do run books now for these alerts? Like if I'm getting an alert, I should know what that is. And the automated en uh, uh, enforcement I haven't heard, you know, like Brito and people like that are trying to do that stuff around like security and and that, but I'm not hearing of people doing those very well. <laughs> I'm hearing of people going, we're testing it out with stuff where if we get it wrong, it's not that big of a deal versus like Samia, all of a sudden you get a, a, a you know, extra million dollar uh, bill from your your vendor, or you find out that when they come in and they audit you, then it's huge. So Samia's had her, her, her hand up for a while and then JGP and Yulia. Yeah, I, I think it's happening. It, if it's not happening in your data team, your security risk and compliance team is doing it, right? They are doing zero trust architecture and you should be partnering with them if you're not. I've seen uh, folks who with um, using privilege access management, you can say this line of business and this group of people only have access to these financial data sets and the source systems, right? Even in your software systems, or your operational systems, the same concepts go in. So to me, um, enforcement and alerting is happening effectively. I've seen it consistently over the last decade. Without that, you can't be SOX compliant. That's the number one thing all organizations have to invest in. Um, and there are very specific rules around how you manage access to data and enforce policies on even what columns are visible to who. So to me, those are just foundational things that have been around for a while. Yeah, I mean, if the only people you're satisfying with your platform, if you think your only constituents are your producers and your consumers, you're headed for trouble. You're headed for a lot of legal trouble. You're headed for a lot of legal friction. You're headed for somebody bringing the hammer down, right? Like you've got to figure out how to bring those people into the conversation very far left in the, in the actual development process.
JGP, sure. you've had your hand up for the longest. But I'd like to understand the comment you made in, in. So I don't know if this is if you're going to talk about that, but you made a comment in the chat. Like my take is that a, 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 is that quantum will be different from company to company based on how they define the actual data product. This is something I kind of fundamentally disagree with, but I'd like to hear your 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 take on that. Um. Well. So I guess we should give the flexibility to organizations to define their data products, what actually matters to the business. This is where I'm coming from. And if for one, let's say for one, uh, for like a business unit, it's gonna be a data set. So um, this data set is uh, consists of tables that are updated on a batch uh, cadence, it totally could be a, um, a table. I see it like this, but let's okay. say, let's say they have um, a machine learning model deployed at the production, then their quantum could be even the event. But and so, this so, is so so I so I, th I think I think we're actually in agreement. But so in in the case of this AI model, okay, would you put the AI model in the data product itself or yes, in the data quantum yes. itself? Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, the total is a model is consists of smaller pieces that should be defined as a quantum, while the model is actually a product that delivers value uh, by itself. That's why it's a product. This is my take. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I sorry, just to tell you, I I completely agree with you because if you have a data product mindset, let's say I build a customer churn analysis, which is just the diagnostic who left, right? It's a dashboard that tells me this. Well, I could technically improve the customer churn product by creating an actual machine learning model that now proactively tells me this person might churn or this is the key drivers as to why they churn. And to me, that is still the same product with different i guess we would call it yeah. quantities now like, Quant yeah. yeah 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 it's a sidecar it's a sidecar you put in your quantum right the thing is what is the implementation and when you look at the three planes that, that Jamak described the infrastructure plane for example we don't care the data product plane that that's what we care and we can actually build the interfaces to this to this world, but the product behaves in the same way. So yes, the products are different because they have different outcomes, but the implementation or the behavior of the quantum is the same. I think we, yeah. we kind of, yeah. Well, uh, on the same page. A lot of people have said Good. that <laughs> their internal definition of data product is so convoluted that they've started to call them different things. So like mesh data product or um, yeah, Austin, um, Shane Gibson calls them an information product because it's not about just the data, right? The data <laughs> is the ones in the zeros. So if you don't have any information or like there, there's all of these, these things and data product is an overloaded term. Um, and so, uh, you know, people have a different immediate conception. So some people call them something different. You know, um, some people call them data quantum. Some people call them, you know, mesh data products. Some people call them all this stuff because it just gets crazy, right? And that that's where you've got to actually just ask the other person, what is your definition? What are we talking about? So that I'm not saying data product and you're saying data product and we mean completely different things. Well, the thing is, uh, just, just to jump on this vocabulary thing, okay? The, it, it's, it's a big part. And when, when you... I don't know if any of you read the whole ETIL part, the ETIL, you know, standard library, blah, 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 that the British government set up. I just read the very beginning of it, but ETL says the first thing you should you should state is your vocabulary, okay? You start a project, you set up the vocabulary, so everybody aligns to that. And maybe this is something as a group, as uh, we need to have more formalized definition as well, okay? And and that, that would help the industry as a whole. <laughs> I'm finding that one of the key things for doing data mesh is the last 15, 20% of a meeting is just going, okay, did we understand each other? What did you mean by this? And are we in agreement on next steps? And that that saves 
days of work on every single rev, even though it feels like, well, of course we're on the same page. And then you start to talk and it doesn't, it's not at all. Yeah, Yulia. I don't want to keep up everyone, uh, you know, of time, but the thing is, it's not just in data mesh or in data development, you know, it's entirely through the entire organization. Nailing down the definitions will help to reduce miscommunication, uh, you know, shortening the time of the meetings. And it's so much helpful to establish this shared understanding about uh, words that actually should be beyond data and, and you know, things like that. It, I mean, it's just human communication at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, basic things, right? Okay, on this basic thing comment, maybe we sh this is where we should wrap up. Unless someone has, you know, we are, we said we initially said half an hour. We never stay half an hour, but maybe forty five minutes should be the kind of the art stuff. But I don't want to break. If anyone wants to add a last comment, uh, please do. Yeah, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I was was thinking uh, maybe the defining what a data product is and how it is implemented is also part of. The, the federated governance principle so that in a certain setting in which you are going to realize data mesh, you're going to talk to each other and agree on, okay, this is what we call a data product. And because you need some kind of um, more, sorry, some kind of things that are uniform to make them interoperable so that they can be connected to each other. So well, the extreme of that, everyone can define it as its own uh will not make it interoperable with the rest of the organization so maybe it's part of the governance part i think that's an excellent topic for 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 our next uh chat which will not be next week unfortunately i have something but the week after um things happen um uh, but uh yeah and i think that's 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 an excellent topic tom and i hope you will be there to animate it as well so with all that said, and, and if, if people everybody. can't get enough of me and it, but before then, if they can't wait another week, I am doing the great data mesh debate or great data debate with with Austin next week. So <laughs> have fun, have fun with them. Oh yeah, guys, thank you so much for joining again, and uh, see you not next week, but the week after. Bye. Thanks, everybody.